Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Those who are just tuning in for their first event this month, we are celebrating biodiversity this month. So we live on an amazing planet. We've discovered over 2 million species. Scientists think there could be millions more left to discover. So it's an absolutely amazing and biodiverse planet that we live on. But at the same time, our biodiversity is really threatened. We are losing species at much faster than normal rate. And many new studies have come out to say that if we don't change our ways and start protecting our habitats and our species, that we could lose a lot of the life that makes uh, our planet so special. So I'm really excited today to be hosting Hernani uh, Oliveira. He is a scientist and conservation biologist who has been working with bats for the last 10 years and recently started to work with birds and arthropods uh, for his PhD. He's had an amazing journey in which he's traveled all over the world, but spent a lot of time in Brazilian uh, habitats like the Amazon rainforest, the Atlantic rainforest, the savanna, as well as places like Costa Rica and Cameroon. He's really passionate about photography and uses his trips out into nature to make videos and images that he can share with people to educate them about the importance of conservation and science as well. So Hernani, it is so great to be stealing a little bit of your time today. We're excited to learn about one of your recent expeditions and uh, then we'll turn the students loose with questions after that. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, Joe. And Quite an important one and, and a nice one, especially regarding this expedition that I did. Let me just start sharing the screen like, so you can see some pictures as well. Like, uh, oops, wrong screen. Uh, especially in this biodiversity uh, month. Uh, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about my story uh, or about our expedition to Mount Cameron, which is one of the most biodiversity places biodiversity rich places in the world. Actually, our group described quite some new species to this mountain, to this specific place. And our group started working there. It's uh, for about four years ago. It's a mountain in, in West Africa. I'm going to show you the map a little bit, but it's a mountain in West Africa, which is quite rich and quite undiscovered. For those who doesn't know, uh, Africa is one of the most unknown places on earth, basically because of all the the poverty, but also the lack of infrastructure, the lack of access to many places, and also very few people actually go there to study still in comparison to other places such as South America, for example. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, um, as Joe already said, like I'm Brazilian. I have worked mostly in Brazil with bats for the last 12 years. But in the last couple of uh, months, I have started working more with pollinators in different countries, mainly Czech Republic and in, in Africa. Right? So I'm based, I'm based uh, actually now in, in Prague. So I'm act now, right now in Czech Republic with some cold temperatures and cloudy weather doing a postdoc. So I'm actually studying the interactions of pollinators in mountains in Europe and in, in Africa. So I'm actually doing, we go to the field, we set some cameras and we see who are visiting the flowers in, in Europe and in Africa, we compare this, 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 this visitation. But that's the more science-based stuff. I'm actually going to show to you some of the more cool stuff behind what we do as well. So one of the places that we study more is this, where is this dot here showing in Cameroon, in Africa. Uh, it's basically a mountain in Africa. It's actually the, the highest mountain in West Africa, which reaches 4,000 meters high. Uh, it's also an active volcano. So yes, we go to a place that at any point can just explode and we can can kind of die like while during the expedition there. But hopefully, like luckily for us, the, the lava flow is quite slow so that we would have time to, to move out of the of the volcano if there's an, er an, uh, an eruption. But in the last century, just for you to have an idea, there, was, uh, five, there were five eruptions in this volcano in Africa. So it's actually one of the most active volcanoes in Africa and also in the world as well. It's also uh, a biodiversity rich place. So around the world, we have these uh, red areas that we call it biodiversity hotspots. They are called like this because they host a lot of species in a very small area and they're also highly threatened. So as Joe said, we have a high number of species around the world. But if we protect only these places where they are in red in the map, 
we would be protecting around 40 to 50 percent of all the species that we have on the planet while only conserving or while only protecting a very small area of our planet and this mountain is in this west uh, is this west african forest right in the middle of the map in africa so it's part of one of the places that has one of the highest biodiversity uh biodiversity in the world but we mainly know we we, we don't know almost anything about it because very few people go there and the situation now is also very bad because there's been a, a, a political crisis and almost a civil war going on. So now even less people go there to study this mountain. And our group here is one of the main groups that still go there. And we went on the wet season, which has one very specific uh, peculiarity there. So if you go and see this map, shows the annual precipitation around the world. So if you go to US and Canada, most of the places in US and Canada they have around 1,000 millimeters of rain, 1,500 millimeters of rain per year. That means that if you pick a bucket with one meter per one meter, one meter of length per one meter wide, and you catch the whole rain for a whole year, it's going to fill this bucket by one meter more or less of water, or one meter and a half. But this mountain that we go is actually one of the wettest places on Earth as well. So it's actually the third wettest place on Earth. So if you have a bucket of one meter per one meter, we would have a column of water that goes to 11 meters of rain or 11 to 17 meters of rain, which means that in one year in this mountain, we have 10 to 17 times more rain than anywhere in the US and Canada. And it's just insane. It's some completely insane amount of water that we had there. And we went on the wet season when the most of the rain actually falls. Away. So this is a view of the mountain on the left a little bit from a gas station so it doesn't look that high but it's actually oh, it's it's actually more than 4000 meters high so it's a very high mountain it's actually the highest mountain of the west africa one of the highest mountains of the continent as well of africa and also one of the highest mountains in the world but as most biodiversity hotspot places like, it's actually uh being faced with uh, a lot of threats like. so one of the main threats that's happening there is that around the mountain they cut all the forest and they plant uh, tea. So this is a tea plantation when you can see most a lot of African people working. As you know, like Africa is a very poor continent and tea plantation is one of the main places where people, when they need jobs and they need to work in something, they go to, to get some money, to, to get some profits. So, but there's also the side of the deforestation as well. So they cut all the forest to have these tea plantations and for people to work and to live as well. And most of these companies are from outside Africa. So this also creates some problems sometimes about people accepting their work there and, and, and all this, this kind of stuff. There's also oil palm plantations around the mountain. I don't know how much you have heard about this, but oil palm plantations are one of the main deforestation causes like around the world as well. So basically around the mountain, they cut all the forests and they plant these trees which they take these fruits and they make an oil that's it's good for cooking for many different things and it's very common in africa or at least in cameroon that people use this 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 oil to cook and to, to use in many different uh, for many different utilities but the the wrong side the bad side is that usually for a lot of animals these forests they're not so goodly so in comparison to the forest of the mountain these oil palm plantations they're not so it's not so common to find many animals in this forest although for birds they can be quite good which is a bit a tricky position in terms of conservation but that's us hiking up the forest so for us to get to the mountain we had to go through these oil palm plantations which we didn't see almost anything in terms of animals or any any other kind of different species there it's also a bit tricky sometimes because this uh, mountain has also elephants so it's one of the mountains, it's one of the places where the elephants, they go higher in, the, in, the, in Africa as well. Like, so you can find them at more than 1,000, 1,500 meters. And because of this, sometimes there are poachers that goes, it's not very common, but it happens that sometimes there are poachers that they go in the mountain to hunt for, for elephants and also for other animals. So for a part of our expedition, we had this ranger uh, that he went with us protecting us and scouting us across the whole mountain until actually, he actually saw that we're safe. And then he went to track other people. So you can see that 
it was not a very uh, usual condition that we were there. Apart from the war, from the volcano, from being one of the wettest places on Earth, we also had the problems with the civil war and also poaching. So we need a lot of protection and safeguarding behind us to actually go up the mountain where we spend around 40 days, more or less. And I'm going to show some pictures of what we're doing there as well. Eh? So this is the camp, uh, camp pictures. So how do you go in a mountain in Africa if there are no infrastructure in Africa? Mainly, a lot of places there are no infrastructure to do research. So we actually built our own camp. So we, we went to uh, 650 and 1,100 meters high in the mountain. And we actually started cutting trees with the permission of the park and then building all the facilities that we needed to camp and also to uh, to survive there for, for 40 days. So we actually brought up the mountain uh, half a ton of equipment, so 500 kilos more or less, plus uh, 15 people. So there were around 15 people working the mountain all the time with 100 kilos of equipment, with tents, with, uh, we were bringing goats sometimes up to kill and, and, and feed, make food for us, like making soups, a lot of pasta as well. And this was in the rainy season. So you can see a lot of umbrellas, a lot of uh, waterproof things, and a lot of rain falling from the sky all the time. This is how we cook it there as well. So we basically were cutting the woods from the forest. We're making this, uh, putting this in this arrangement. So we set fire to the big piece of wood. And as soon as they started consuming, they were uh, cooking things in the pots, but also we, we needed to change the wood because they were ending, like they were firing and burning after time. You can see on the back also some of our supplies, which we use it to cook as well. So nothing fancy, usually beans, a lot of pasta, a lot of tuna, uh, a lot of fish, like canned fish. Sometimes when people, it, we, we are in Czech Republic. So Czech Republic is one of the, highest consumption of alcohol in the world, like per inhabitant. So sometimes people bring some beers as well for us to relax and chill a little bit in, in the mountain, which, which was a luxury a little bit, not common, but happens sometimes just to relax in the end of a long week. This is something that was very common as well, that we were storing dried fish. So you're looking now at the top of the fire where we were putting a lot of dried fish and the fish were also drying with time. And the cooker used to, to put uh, this fish in the food, so in pasta, like in rice. Doesn't appear the most uh, safe, hygienic uh, thing to do, but that's how life was. And not all, everything is, is perfect as we would be in a, in a city. But that's how, that's also part of the fun of being a mountain, but barely anybody has been there and also barely any exp expedition has been done there, especially in the wet season. This is also something quite funny that happened. That for me, it was my Indiana Jones time there that we brought, uh, they brought a goat up the, the mountain, they killed the goat, and they make a soup with the head of the goat in the middle. So what we're seeing now is the head of the goat with a soup that was made with it. I actually saw the last breath of the goat before being killed that we ate it afterwards. It was quite a wild expedition as well in some ways. This is how we collected, we drink water. Like, so it, we made, we mainly made a, a small pool with plastic that uh, was three meters, square meters more or less. And the amount of water was so, so much that this, this pool, this little pool was collecting water from the rain and it was able to, 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 to provide enough water for 15 people to drink every day and cook and brush teeth and sometimes even shower if you wanted for 40 days. So it was an immense amount of water and this is actually a lower level of the water like in the pool because it was always usually much more than this. Like. This is a reflex as well of uh, the amount of water that we had in the mountain. So I was walking with my feet there, but the amount of water was so much and I could not get, I uh, could not keep my feet like dry during a lot of time. So it was getting like this. I actually almost had a problem there because my skin was, falling out of my foot at some point. But then it taught me that you could put oil of, uh, of cars to actually make it a little bit impermeable so I could walk with more uh, safety, like in the mountain. But I, I went for a very uh, stressed period with my feet because it, it was all the time wet and I could not get dry and I was almost stopped working like because of this. But then everything went fine. 
Well, I talk a little bit about the, the, the expedition, but now it's a bit of the forest. So this is a picture from inside the forest in the lower elevation, so 650 meters high. So you can see that uh, it's a bit of an open forest in comparison to the other forests that I have worked in, in Brazil and in Costa Rica. It's not so closed, but mainly because we are talking about a mountain that's actually a volcano as well, a volcano as well. So most of the soil is sometimes very rocky. So it's not a very solid uh, sand or a very solid, not so, so rocky soil. So you have many trees scattered and a lot of open space in the canopy of the trees. We have many places that you can see actually the sun coming inside the forest, which is quite unusual, well, at least for the forests that have been in Brazil and in Costa Rica and in, in, in other countries as well. This is also something quite interesting in, in Cameroon in Africa as well in comparison to, to South America, because in South America we have bromeliads. So uh, bromeliads. So if you have if you think about the epiphytes, which are the plants that they go on the top of other plants to get sun. Uh, these bromeliads, they don't happen in Africa. They only happen in South America. So I was curious actually to see how the trees are going to be in Africa when I went there. And you can see that there are a lot of uh, lianas and small plants hanging on the top of the trees, but no bromeliads, but everything is full of plants uh, everywhere because they also enjoy not only the humidity, but also the, the, the sunlight that they can get on the top of the trees. This is also an interesting one because you can see the one of the interesting things that they have in Mount Cameroon is that there are no rivers, no permanent rivers in the mountain. So what happens is that when the rain falls, mainly the water accumulates in these little ponds that are actually parts of lava flow. So what you're seeing here is part of uh, the, an old eruption of the volcano that it, it happened there. So it's actually a lava flow path. So the, the volcano erupted, the lava was started to go down and then destroying all the trees and everything in the middle of the way. But then it leaves these places where you have rocks that are made of the, the lava, and also they can be they can store water and can small, can, they, can, they can form uh, non-permanent rivers as well during the rain, which is kind of dangerous sometimes, because if you're standing something like this and it starts a heavy rain, you can kind of have a, a big flow of water suddenly coming out of nowhere in your direction, you can get in trouble when you work in this place. So I can, if you're on the side of, of the lava flow and the river starts to flow, you are, you're not able to cross to the other side. This is part of our team, like walk in the forest, to check people, also Cameroonian guy, like helping us like in working in the forest as well. These are some uh, grasshoppers that we used to see there. So as a biodiversity rich place, uh, there's a lot of different species of many things. Uh, my boss, the Robert Tropek, he actually discovered, uh, described uh, some moth species and also butterfly species from this mountain, which nobody knew before based on DNA. These are some snails as well, as you might expect in a very humid place. There are a lot of things that live well, the high diversity of things that live well in, in humid place. So a high diversity of snails we could see there as well. But this is actually what we went to do there. So I don't know if you can see uh, something different a little bit or not so natural in the picture. So we actually went there to record plant pollinator interactions. So what is this? Like we actually went there to see who was visiting the flowers of the plants that they have in the mountains. And here in this picture, we have a camera that's actually hidden, not only for us, but also for the animals in the forest, because if they see the camera, they, they, they can detect the camera, they, they would, they might, uh, they could not approach the, they might not approach the, the flowers, so actually hide in the camera, so it's actually in the middle of the, in the middle to the uh, lower right of the, of the screen, you have a camera that's hidden by a, a, a green uh, cover. It's actually recording the, the flower in the center. So we, we were used to, to hide the camera to record the, the pollinators, everything that was visiting the flowers. I'm going to show some videos about things that we have visited, that are flowers that we were recording there. So we have from bats to uh, broadens to lizards, and also, of course, arthropods as also insects. This is a picture of me working the place. So most of the time it was raining, and we have these waterproof computers to, to also uh, program the cameras to record the flowers, but they were not completely waterproof. So of course, if you 
merge like a waterproof computer in a pool, it might not be waterproof. So we we also protected the computers a little bit with umbrellas and the best that we could. So this is actually a picture of how most of the time during these 40 days, the expedition looked like for most of us. So basically holding umbrellas, holding a computer, we plugged in a camera and setting the cameras to record plant pollinator interactions or the visitors of the flowers. These are some of the butterfly species that we saw there as well. So there's a high diversity of butterfly species, but it was funny to me because in comparison to Costa Rica, to Brazil, the diversity of butterflies are not so high. They're high, but they're much lower than other places of the world as well. This was also a bit of the diversity of flowers that we saw there. So we have a Cicotria, Cicotria in the top uh, left, some begonias, uh, one begonia in the top uh, middle, and patients uh, in the top right, in the, in the middle left as well, a fromomo in the left bottom, a costas in the medium bottom, uh, a plectrantus in the middle of the picture, and uh, I just forgot the name of the last one, but yeah, I will remember in a bit and I'll tell you. Link. But these are just some of the plants that we, we have been recording there, but there are many others that was also recording different elevations. We were working from uh, 600 until the last, uh, the savannas of the, of the mountain, which happens in the highest, highest elevations of the mountain. This is also a different part of the project where, where we were uh, capturing birds. So this is a mist net for those who never seen like what, how, uh, uh, how capture birds, uh, uh, looks like in the wild. So we basically set these nets that in this case, they, they went until the top of the trees. So about 15, 20 meters high. We had actually some people climbing until the top of the trees. Some some guy, Christoph, which was specialized on this. So it's basically only hired or mostly hired to set these nets. So you can go that you can see that they go very high and they used to go to catch birds that were flying since the bottom, since the underground until the top of the trees. So we had a quite a high diversity of birds that we, we caught there, like, but we were actually interested just on mostly on some of them. Like, this part of the diversity of birds were interesting because we could actually compare the diversity of birds between elevations. Like, so the higher the elevation that you go, usually you have less, like lower amount of species. And in the bottom of the volcano of the mountains, usually have a higher diversity of species of mostly anything. Like, but that's, and in the middle, you have uh, sometimes a peak in species richness of some groups. Like. But for birds, we, we, we were comparing different elevations, but also we were interested in these guys here, which are a group of birds that are called some birds because they have a mark under the wing that's actually yellow. And they are one of the two groups of birds that are pollinators, specializing in pollination of flowers. And so you can see that some of these species, they have very long beak, and why this is interesting, because only some birds and hummingbirds actually specialized on pollinating flowers. Apart from these two groups, there are no other birds that actually specialize on, on nectar of flowers. They can eat different things that can even include nectar of flowers at some point, but they're not specialized on this. But in these birds, you can clearly see by the length of their beak, especially of these species on the bottom right, that's actually an endemic and a threatened piece of this mountain. They only happen this mountain or this area, uh, Cinnamon Montra Oritis. It's called the Cameron sunbird, which you can see that has a very long beak. And it's one of the main feeders of sunflowers that we had recorded in the mountain. And this is a picture of part of our group, like working there. So we have mainly Czech people, Camarino people, and me, the <laughs> outsider, the Brazilian in the middle, and everybody looking very hairy after 40 days without shaving and some people without showering as well. Uh, I'm basically going to show now some videos about uh, how the volcano looks like on the, from, the, from the drone, our drone videos, and also some uh, of the recordings of the flowers, of, so what was visiting in the flowers. So this is the village. Uh, this is the village where the our main campsite was, was located. So you can see that they're mainly made of uh, small houses, simple houses, but everything was very safe. 
very, very safe. This is the future. The future meaning for me, guys, about the expedition for many years already. Right? This is something interesting about the expedition here in Mount Kenya is that the Czech people, they work a lot with the, the local people in Mount Kenya. This is the forest from the top. So usually we see a lot of uh, people from Cameroon working the expeditions as well. There's a lot of mix. There's actually one of the students from Cameroon here in Prague doing a PhD like here in the group. So it's a very integrative project with people that they from the place that they're working with, which is mainly Cameroon like now in this in this part. This is a different part of the mountain as well, where you can see the transition between the forest to the savannas or to the more open open spaces. For those who doesn't know, like the mountains usually they have a, a place or a height where the forest they don't they don't go anymore. So it's called tree line. So tree line is a place where there's the division between the forest from the grasslands on, on up the mountains. Right? This is people from our group crossing some tourists as well, like in the grasslands as well already. So on the top of the mountain, the highest elevations. And also you can see there are no trees, that's why it's called tree line. It's mainly grasslands. Many grass everywhere. This is Stepan and his wife, I think, like in the video with one of the main guys from Cameroon also that were leading the expeditions like this. And you can see from the top of the mountain also more rocky and how it looks like. This is uh, how the volcano looks like from the top. So when the lava flows, it actually goes from these places. Like it's kind of alien and mystery, but it's very, very cool. I think very few people have been until the top. It's a quite steep climb at some points, and people usually take more than one day climbing there into the top, from the bottom into the top. Canada should be one of the safest countries in Africa as well. But because there's been a civil war now, not many people are climbing the mountain. And this is actually affecting a lot of the economy of the country. And the Camarino people used to complain a lot about this. This is a view from the top of the mountain as well, where you can see the transitions between the grasslands, a little bit of the forest, and the, and the top of the, the volcano. Hey, Hernani. Yep. I'm wondering if we can check out a little bit of the video of the animals visiting the okay. plants and then switch to questions. I want to make sure we okay. save some time sure. for the Q&A. Yep. Okay. Okay. yep, yep. All right, perfect. Okay. That's, uh, so this is a lizard visiting the, you're appearing a bit, yeah? Visiting the flowers, one of the flowers. Uh, this is a galago, which is a kind of uh, primate that happens only in Africa visiting one of the flowers as well, it's coming. So we have also the camera set at night, so we can get things visiting the flowers during the night. So you can see it's clearly drinking nectar. Uh, a hoverfly visiting the, the flower as well, just to show a little bit of the diversity of things that we capture in our cameras. And this is a bat, a fruit bat, that's also feeding nectar of Kigeli, one of the plants in, in Africa. Uh, Butterflies. A dormouse as well, like coming at night to feed on nectar. It's coming. So it also gives a lot of work after the expedition because we need to come back to the lab. And not, I'm not doing this, but it's mainly the, the team that's uh, identifying everything that's being visited in the, the flowers as well. So they go video by, by video, watching everything. A squirrel also visiting the camera, the, the, the flowers. And it should be checked for all the time that the camera has been recording. So it's a huge work and uh, it's a lot of money involved as well. Like they have been 
going there during many expeditions and there's a lot of people involved as well as a big project team. also a bee which is one of the main visitors of the flowers as well another type of bee a non-social bee feast in the flower a moth Peace in the flower during the night, which are one of the main problems to identify as well sometimes. One of the sunbirds coming to feed on the neck of the flower as well, like the Cameroon sunbird, the endemic species. One more moth visiting the flower. A mammal, which a mammal which is not usually it's not common, but happens sometimes to visit the flowers as well. Or eat the flowers, depending on, on what he wants to do like there. Sometimes the flowers get eaten as well, not just pollinated or well, they don't go only for the nectar. More butterflies coming to the flowers as well. And then what's mainly it's Yep. All right, Hernani, you're back. Um, <laughs> you know, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's a part of the world that very few people get to see. It looks like an amazing area full of biodiversity. It looks like you had a great time and those images and those photos uh, are incredible. So looks like you did a lot of good science while you were out there. Thank you. And we survived in the end. <laughs> uh, surviving is always good as well. Yeah. Field work can be pretty exciting. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's meet some of our groups and let's start grabbing some questions. So let's start off in Smithville, Missouri. I can see there's some students up at the camera in Mrs. Crouch's class. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, boys and girls? Hi. Hello. All right. Who's got a question for Annie? Yeah. Have you ever discovered a new species? Nah, not myself, like, but my, my, the team that I work here, they have described at least, I think, five or seven species of butterflies, like, in butterflies and moths, like, from the, from this mountain. Like, and pretty much, there's a lot more to be discovered as well. We're mainly restricted sometimes by time and money. So, with time, much more species are about to be discovered and investing more money. I'm sure that many, 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 many more are going to be discovered as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of students probably don't know that it's not just as easy as seeing it. Uh, sometimes it takes years for a new species to be recognized. That's very true. And in our case, we usually uh, use DNA. So we actually go collect the DNA and we, we send usually to Canada, actually to Guelph. So in Guelph, actually the DNA is sequenced and then the species are, are, are discovered based on the DNA sequence from them. Very cool. Well, let's go over to California. Mrs. Dam's class is hanging out with us. How are we doing, California? Good. Good. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have a question for her name? How does changes in the environment affect birds' habitat? Sorry? Can, I, can, I couldn't hear. How does changes to the environment affect birds' habitat? Oof. Like usually in the case of the oil palm, they actually improve the, the habitats of the of the birds. So incredibly, actually the birds benefit from this kind of of these changes. Like so, there actually more species there. But this is not common at all. Usually in other places, like in other places, usually you have a deplete in the you have less species than in than in the forest. But in this case in Mount Cameron, actually the oil palm plantation boosts. Like so there are more species of birds there. And actually in the forest, which is not common, but that's what happens there. Okay, is that because it's just more space? It's easier for them to find their food when there's less um, less coverage in the forest? So probably because they provide a different kind of habitat for the birds, and also the birds are able to migrate as well from the forest to these uh, oil palm plantations as well. Okay. But I don't believe that they actually provide enough food for the birds to maintain themselves in the in these habitats. There's also a lot of gardens around the connecting the, the, the habitats around the, the, the mountain they actually help to boost the biodiversity together with the, the oil palm. 
All right, so a strange case where uh, habitat loss is actually benefiting some of the species, but obviously hurting other ones. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, okay, Mrs. Hoxley's class, fifth graders hanging out in Independence, Missouri. Let's get their microphone turned on. Um, on Independence. Uh, how do you uh, get the pictures without the animals running away? How do we get the pictures? Yeah, so we cover the, the cameras very well like, with uh, green. Uh, cover and we try to do our best to not make the cameras visible for them because if they see the camera there's the one uh, video of the squirrel that it looked like he looked at the camera he saw the camera and he just ran away but what we do is that we try to cover or to camouflage the camera as best as we can so the animals don't see it and then we can record them in the without disturbing them very much yeah so you leave the cameras out there and walk away and then what triggers the camera? Is it the motion of the animals triggers the camera? So in our case, the cameras are recording for 24 hours. Right? So it's always recording. Right? And then we pick the recordings and then that's, I forgot to say this detail like that. So we, we catch the recordings and then we see everything that has been recording across this 24 hours period. So during day and during night as well. Right? Okay, very cool. So there are some camera traps that use like a laser or the animal moving, but yours just run the whole time and you, you watch the video after. Yep, yep, because some things are visible in the flowers, they are too small. So if you use a trigger method to actually start recording the, the anything that's crossing the front of the camera, some things like butterflies or uh, flies, they might not trigger the, the camera to start recording. Gotcha. So that's the way that we do it, keep recording. Okay, very cool. We're okay. going to go to Mill uh, Pond, British Columbia. We have... Uh... Oh, Mill Bay, British Columbia. Sorry, we have some high school students hanging out with us with Mr. McCarthy. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, BC? Yeah. Yeah. All right, who's got a question for her nanny? Uh, Jackie here has a question. Um, so bees were just put on the endangered species list. Have you noticed any like differences in their population in Cameroon? So we don't focus so much on the conservation of species in this project specifically. Uh, it's mostly focused on describing new species and seeing what's actually pollinating the flowers. So we haven't seen any difference or trends in the populations of like mostly anything there. But what happens there is that they have a unique population of uh, elephants in the mountain. And we, we could, there are some people that actually work with the camera traps. So actually recording, monitoring the populations of uh, mammals, like there are a lot of monkey species there, uh, elephants as well, like in, in the, but we mostly don't focus on this. Like we mostly focus on the flower things, on the pollination of the flowers of the mountain. Yeah, and I, I, I would guess that you're one of the first groups to look uh, at bee species there. So you're kind of getting that, that first amount of information that can be used later to find out if it's changing. Yep, yep. Actually, as far as I know, we are the first or the second group that went during the dry season, during the wet season in this mountain. So we're pretty much discovering anything that's happening. It's, if you see the work behind, it's, it seems that we're just putting cameras and recording, but the batteries are quite heavy. They're like five kilos. So it's a lot of batteries carrying all the time around the mountain, like charging, recharging. There's, we need to put fuel like in the recharger of the batteries as well. Like, and we're in the middle of nowhere with no electricity in tents, like eating goats that are killed in the mountains. So it's quite a lot of heavy work like there. Yeah, that is some some really, uh, you know, it's like the exploration you see in the movies, heading out somewhere uh, and really having to survive off the land for a little bit in some cases. Yep, yep. Uh, Mrs. Paradin's group, grade sevens, hanging out with us in Louisiana. Let me get their microphone turned on. There it is. Hi, I'm grade sevens. Hi. 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 <laughs> We can't see. So get in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got one question for you. Tell who you are. I'm, I'm, I prefer to not reveal my identity. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go ahead. What's your question? My question is how do you deal with mosquitoes or other pests? Oof, that's a good question. So, incredibly, there are not a lot of mosquitoes like in the mountain, but in the house that we're living before going to the mountain, there was a lot of midges, which was a big problem. <laughs> the main problem in the dry season is the honeybees, right? but uh, I didn't go in the, the dry season. Mostly in the wet season, we don't have any problems with mosquitoes, incredibly, or anything 
that was kind of stingy or or bitey or anything like that. Right? So it was incredibly safe in this in this sense. Right? The most the biggest problem was the water about how much water is falling all the time and how wet you get. You are all the time or never dry, never, never, ever dry. So in the dry season, do you think there would have been more of a problem with the insects? Yes, especially if that's that's what I heard at least. I didn't go to the dry season, but what I heard is that usually the honeybees are covering everything. And I'm actually uh, allergic to honey to stings of honeybees like, or insects in general. So I would have a big problem, but usually people were just leaving them away. And as far as you don't disturb them very much, you should be fine. Because African bees are quite famous by being very aggressive and by having causing problems to people. But if you don't disturb them, their nest or anything like that, it should be kind of fine. All right, very cool. Well, Hernani, we did a swing through our classrooms. I'm gonna try and do a speed round and visit our classrooms one more time and see if they have a quick follow-up for us. So we'll start off with Mrs. Crouch's group. I see someone up at the camera. Okay. Um, what is your biggest problem? from the rainforest? So my biggest problem is that I never been in, in Africa before. Like, and so going, going to a place that I never been before and not knowing what to expect very much in the middle of a civil war and also in a forest that I never been before was something that made me very cautious. Like, but also the water in my feet was a big, 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 big problem. <laughs> I almost actually had to stop the expedition, like working the expedition at some point because my feet were completely destroyed. Like if you see my my the skin of my foot was almost like falling off, like because so much water all the time. And we were walking with these rubber boots, but actually the water was coming in the rubber boots sometimes. It was watery inside as well. Like so I could not get water. It was it was a nightmare until the middle of the expedition, more or less for me. I think other people were used to cup to couple with it like in a better to cope with it in a better way, but for me, until the middle of the expedition, until I started passing oil of the cars into my feet, it was a big problem. All right. The things the things that happen on expedition, but at least there was lots to drink. So I guess there's maybe <laughs> uh Mrs. Dam's group, your microphone in California is on again. All right, I'm um, here. Um, do you think there is more similarities between birds and bats or more differences between birds and bats? You mean similarities by what you're visiting? What you're visiting? <laughs> or the species like that. So, so the bats in, 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 in camera, remote camera, they're quite different than the birds. Like. So birds, you have a lot of colorful birds, like nice birds, that they are they're quite different from their appearance. And the bats, they are not so colorful for the birds. So they're they're quite different ones. So they're very not they're not very similar between them. Are there any? Uh, just looking at the pictures, the birds seem very small, and the bats seem very small. Are there any big species of birds? Big species of bats? Yep. So usually the birds you can have big species of birds, but also some big species of bats as well. So in Africa, some of the bigger species of bats in the world as well. So they can they can be pretty big in Africa the bats, but also the birds as in other places. Well, you can have bigger birds. We actually had saw some eagles like in the in the mountain, which were pretty big, and we saw some migration of some bigger bats as well. But bat big bats are around 500 grams, like big uh, in terms of weight, and big birds are two, three, four kilos like big. So they're much bigger than the bats right? in comparison. Also, the bats are much less colorful than the birds. Right? All right, cool question. Uh, Mrs. Hoxley's class, your microphone's on again. Okay. Hi, my name is CJ, and what I wondered was, other than birds and butterflies, what other creatures did you see? Ooh, good question. I saw lizards, not anything very well. I saw some snakes as well, and I heard the elephants from the distance. So there's a point that we're in the lower elevation that you could hear the elephants making noise at the distance, because usually when it's rainy, they kind of stay, they, they don't, they, they move the mountain, but usually they don't go to the lower elevations. That's what they say at least. Like, and in the dry season, they stay close to the lakes. But at some points we, we, we heard the, the elephants at the distance in the lower elevation. But usually it was the elephants. Uh, some people saw chimpanzees also close to the camp, which was very cool, but I, it was, I was not in this elevation at the time. So I didn't see, but many people saw. Mandrews as well, which is another kind of monkey. Uh, I saw mainly lizards, the snakes, and the insects that were visiting the flowers, and I heard the elephants. 
but I hope to be back one day to see more things. All right, very cool. Chimpanzees, that would have been something. Yep. Um, Mr. McCarthy's group, British Columbia, your microphone's on if you have a follow-up. Hi, just wondering with the amount of rain that you have, uh, how does that affect the soil on the mountain and is there a lot of erosion that is occurring all the time? Very good question. So what happens in this part, especially in this side of the mountain, because the rain is not equal in both sides of the mountain, but in, in this side of the mountain, you actually have very little soil. So everything is just draining down the mountain. So you have a very rocky uh, kind of terrain. So you actually have to be very cautious about walking because it's mainly rocks. You're, you're walking in rocks on top of rocks, on top of rocks. And that's also a problem because the trees are also on the rocks. So every time there's a big rain, you could always see the trees falling. And sometimes they could actually fall in, in, on top of us because we were surrounded by the forest as well. So it was kind of a tricky terrain to work as well. One of the guys from the, one of the leader of the expedition's fall and he almost twisted his knee. So he spent half of the expedition walking with something to, to help him to walk in the expedition. So it's very tricky as well in this sense. All right, so not only was the water affecting your feet, it was also almost dropping trees on you. Sounds yep, like, yep. Sounds like an interesting time. <laughs> Yep. But hey, if you want to do some new science, sometimes you got to take some risks and get to some of those really amazing places. That's it. Like, if you want to go to some place where a few people have been before, that's the kind of thing you want to do. All right. And one more trip to Mrs. Paradin's class. Your microphone is on if you guys have another question. Yeah. Tell her who you are. I'm Ava. Uh, do animals uh, recover from volcanic eruptions? That's a very good question. Um, I'm actually not sure about how much the volcanic eruptions are affecting the, the fauna there. I don't, know, I don't know if anybody actually knows because few people go there to study this mountain. But I would expect that it would change quite a lot for some groups such as the butterflies, for example, because there's a quite a big change like in the landscape. The trees, they fall, there's a more grass. So I imagine that there's a quite a big change for many different groups, especially some that uh, they are more forest uh, animals than actually grassland animals. Like, but I don't know if anybody actually knows how to answer this question properly. And that's one of the main things that motivate people to keep coming back there. Because there's a many things in this mountain that we actually have no idea about what's happening. And as soon as the next eruption starts, we have another potential question to answer already. All right. And I think that's what's really exciting is um, a lot of people think that we've been everywhere and we've discovered everything, but that's not true at all. There's still so much left to explore and discover, a lot of good science left to be done. So we need some more biologists out there uh, exploring and, and finding out what's going on. That's very true, that's very true. All right. Well, first of all, classrooms, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Your questions were awesome as always. And Hernani, thanks so much for sharing that expedition with us, some of the biodiversity uh, and, you know, seeing some of those videos is pretty cool because I bet not a lot of people have seen those species uh, from those areas. So pretty cool to be able to show those to classrooms today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to, to hear about the expedition and to hear me as well. All right. Well, the last thing I'll do, boys and girls, I'm going to turn your microphones on. If you want to get nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you to Hernani. <laughs> All right. They always do such a good job with that last part. Lots of our boys and girls. Again, thank you so much for hanging out. Hernani, thank you so much. We look forward to maybe another event after another expedition. And thank you. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.